Okay, good morning. So this talk is called What Richard Feynman Taught Me About Programming, or Programming the Feynman Way. Hands up if you already know a bit about Richard Feynman. Okay, hands up if you don't know anything about Richard Feynman. Like one person, two people, and the cameraman. Perfect. Um, okay, so this is going to be interesting. Um, so why, why this talk? Why, why, why would I give this talk? And, um, and who am I? And, and how did all this come about? Well, I have been interested in the life and work of Richard Feynman for a very, very long time, uh, well over 20 years. Um, I had something of a misspent youth. I decided I wanted to be an academic and follow in Feynman's footsteps a little bit. But I soon discovered that being a PhD student is really pretty lonely and not much fun. Um, so I dropped out of writing code for the Large Hadron Collider. And instead, I decided that writing music websites and films websites for Hollywood was a much better idea. And so one of the, one of the first things I learned was that, that the academic life can be, can be very lonely, but at the same time, there was this wonderful world of software where you could go and meet other people that were like you, and it was a different kind of the life of the mind without, um, without being as isolating as, as academia sometimes can be. Since then, I kind of wandered around a bit. I did sort of the whole dot-com boom thing for a while. Um, I did performance testing for Google's IPO. That was kind of my first job in the financial industry. And I sort of ended up in banking by, by mistake. Um, I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd be the sort of field I'd want to end up in. Um, that's a long story to be told over a beer. Ask me about that sometime. And then I started getting into performance and you know, I, I very quickly found that the sort of financial systems often have these, these horrendous performance problems. And so a large part of the second, of, of the second half of my career today has been about performance. Um, I run this company, J Clarity Now. Um, I helped run the London Java community. I represent all of you guys on the JCP Executive Committee, um, and I spend too much time um, doing community stuff, clearly. So the central point of this talk is actually on this slide. So we're done now. Um, I have a confession to make, and that's this. That I have never really been a believer in the Agile method. So it's time to put the pitchforks away. I know that's going to be kind of controversial to a lot of people here. So I've kind of scuffered my chances of actually getting off this stage alive. So let's try to make the best of it. So OK, so I, I don't really believe in Agile. So what, what does that have to do about Feynman? Well, does anybody know where this picture comes from? OK, so this is the, um, the, the picture that was taken at the 1974 Caltech commencement address, which Richard Feynman gave. And Feynman's theme was this a thing called cargo cult science. Now, hands up if you know what a cargo cult is. OK, only a few people. That's interesting. Um, so the cargo cults are a phenomenon which come from the Second World War. So during the Second World War, obviously, the, um, the, the Allies were trying to retake the Pacific. And so they were coming into contact and needing to use as bases some islands which had never really been you know, that in touch with the rest of the world. So from the point of view of the islanders, that, you know, they, they, they had these, uh, these, these planes land, and you know, the, the marines would come in and lay down you know, sort of landing strips and stuff. And so uh, over time, they, they, you know, the, 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 uh, the local people found that their lives were just horrendously disrupted by these bases and the, these things they didn't really understand. They didn't understand the, you know, the geopolitics, and they didn't understand the fact that you know, the, there was a war on. You know, the, the, obviously, the guys who were, were landing on the islands were bringing them all this cool stuff you know, because they needed to you know, try to minimize the impact on the, on the local people. So then the war ends, and the planes stop coming. So no more cool stuff. No more boxes of things coming off these big metal birds. OK, well, this is bad. Clearly, we want the planes to land. We want the good stuff to come. So the people who were living on the island started to develop um, ways that they, they thought that, you know, to try to, to make the, the planes come. So they built towers, and they built things like this. Now, do you know what this is? This is a bamboo aeroplane. Okay, because you know, obviously, if you have a landing strip, what you need are aeroplanes. So if you don't have any aeroplanes, you build one. So it's an output, and this, you know uh, this, this. This is all relevant. I'm having up hit, got, just got up here and, and started talking crazily at you. This is an output which is superficially similar to what you wanted, but it fails in pretty much every important way to actually be what was required. Okay. So this is really the starting point. And this is why I'm nervous about Agile. Because I have seen so many projects which produce bamboo aeroplanes. 
And I had started to become, you know, very suspicious and very skeptical of this, this claimed benefit that Agile has. You know, everyone knows what the benefit is. That you can get an order of magnitude or more productivity gain by following certain practices. Well, but what if the practices you're following are really this? You know, you're really just reconstructing something which, which, you know, that you don't really understand and hoping to get the same outputs. And instead of which, what you end up with is a bamboo aeroplane. There's one other point which is, which is important, which people you know, sometimes raise when you, when you talk about cargo cults. They say, oh, well, you know, it, that, that doesn't matter, or that wouldn't happen with Agile, because things would automatically correct. This picture was taken in 2007. So over 50 years after the end of the war, despite the fact that, that these islands are now in contact with the rest of the world, these practices are still continuing. And the planes still aren't landing. So it's tempting to dismiss the fact that these, the, the, these aberrations can happen and these, the, these things where we, we, we end up trying to produce bamboo airplanes, but actually they have potentially serious and long-term consequences. And it, it could well be the case, or at least it's my thesis, that, that, that if Agile really was harmful, maybe we could just be keeping perpetuating the, the same cycle. Okay, so that's... That's some background on cargo cults, and it's some background on, on um, why I, I was originally skeptical of, of Agile, and whether I still am or not. Well, I guess we'll talk about that. So something changed. Did anybody want to take a guess as to what changed for me? It was this guy. That's Martin Verberg, for anybody in the room who doesn't know, um, doesn't know him. Uh, and. By the way, I spent a very, very long time looking for the worst possible picture I could of Martin. The problem is he's just too damn photogenic. This is for Java 1 last year, and I happen to know that he is unbelievably hungover at this point. Um, but it's, he still comes out looking okay in the picture, so I'm kind of, I, I need to find some worse pictures of him. So Martin is one of the best technical leaders I have ever met, and if you ever are in a position to work on a project or work with Martin, you should do so. Um, he is quite simply incredible. Um, and this is where this story starts to take a bit of a turn. Because when I looked at the, the projects and the teams that Martin ran, I could see that, that, that there was something very different about them. There was something very odd. And you know, that actually when I analyzed the outputs and I analyzed the speed at which stuff was being delivered and the quality with which it was being delivered, that it was quite unlike any other project. You know, it was the opposite end of the spectrum from a bamboo aeroplane. Um, with the right practices, this order of magnitude improvement that everyone talks about, everyone you know, tells me and assures me is there in Agile, it was for the first time watching Martin I could actually see it. So, okay. So what would Feynman do? Okay. Well, Feynman would say, okay, it's all well and good that we have this order of magnitude improvement. This is awesome. But why? What is it about the way that these projects are run which actually delivers it? Something is causing the aeroplanes to land. But we don't know what it is. So we have to find out. And the more that I dug into this, and the more I started to think about how these, these projects were run and what it was about them that made them different, the more I started to see parallels with this guy and some of his work. So, who was one? Richard Phillips Feynman, RPF from here on in, because you know, that's just too much typing. He's one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century, um, probably ever. Um, the, the 20th century is kind of odd. If you're interested in scientific history, like I am, um, it's kind of strange because you have an embarrassment of riches. You know, in, in no other century do you get, you get the physicists of the, of, the, of the caliber that we did. The 20th century was really odd um, because you have not only um, Richard Feynman, but also Einstein, Paul Dirac, you know, Erwin Schrodinger, you know, it's, there's, there's just a huge number of, of, of incredible minds. And, and sometimes it's nice to play the kind of what-if games, and some people claim that a bunch of the physics that we got in the 20th century, we actually really shouldn't have got until the 21st. So there's, there's all kinds of crazy stuff in the, in the history here. Um, in 1965, Feynman was awarded the Nobel Prize for this thing called quantum electrodynamics. Um, quantum electrodynamics is essentially the very fine detail of what a hydrogen atom does in a magnetic field. Um, we'll talk about QED a bit later on. 
Um, but he also made major contributions to several areas of physics, so superconductivity, superfluidity. Um, he was also you know, responsible for uh, uncovering what happened to the Space Shuttle Ch Challenger um, when, when Challenger blew up. Um, he was part of the Presidential Commission to find out what went wrong. And there's an amazing video of him on YouTube actually showing live in front of the TV cameras what happened to Challenger. So you should, you should look at that. But there's also one other very interesting contribution that he made, um, which was at Los Alamos. Um, so Feynman was basically coerced into joining the Manhattan Project, um, and he worked, went down to, uh, uh, to Los Alamos in order to, to, to work on this. And they needed to do simulations of the nuclear explosion because they needed to get the physics right and they needed to calculate efficiently. Just one problem, no computers. This is 1940. Yeah. There are no such things as electronic computers. So when Feynman talked about a computer, he meant a person. He meant an operator who was performing part of the task of computation. Mechanical calculators, big, you know, sort of desk-sized things that look a bit like typewriters, and people operating them like typists. But he was able to, to understand the calculations that needed to be made and to decompose them into a kind of processing pipeline. So the kind of things that we see these days deep inside chips, Feynman was already thinking about. And this eventually enabled him to simulate the action of an electronic computer. So that it has things like, it, within the pipeline, if you, there are ways of checking it. So there are checksums and things where you can spot where a calculation's gone wrong and backtrack to the operator that made the mistake and restart the pipeline. So it's, it's actually really quite sophisticated in terms of, of what it can do. Uh, and it's a great example of reducing the problem. But there, there are two stories about, about Feynman coming to, uh, to Los Alamos, which are worth telling. And there's, there's loads more in his autobiographies where he talks about safe cracking and all this crazy stuff that he does. But the, uh, the two that I think um, we always want to pick out are how Feynman got to run the computation division. Because he said, well, the guy who ran the, di the division before me, well, he, he fell prey to this disease, which, which affects a lot of people who work with computers. If you've ever worked with computers, then you already understand the disease because there's this delight which comes from being able to see how much you can do. Yeah? And we, we started off, and I, when I turned up, the guy was sitting in his office figuring out how to make the computer calculate um, arc tangent, inverse tangent. So this was totally useless, because we had tables of these things. We could just look them up. But the poor guy had got this disease for the very first time. The guy that invented the, the whole damn thing, he got the disease, and he sat in his office just figuring out what else he could do with it. So, you know, the, people talk about information addiction, they talk about the impact of, 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 of the internet on human cognition. 1940, Feynman had already seen that. And the second story is that, that, yeah, that Feynman was, was, was moving down to Los Alamos along with a whole bunch of scientists. So every, every day there would be big packages and, and things, and they said, you know, you've got, to, you've got to go down to Los Alamos, but you've got to keep it a secret. No one's got to know where you're going. So the nearest station is Albuquerque. So just get... You know, buy a ticket and go by a circuitous route. Feynman didn't like the idea of that. So he said, well, okay. The reasoning goes, if everybody else is going to somewhere different and is going via a circuitous route to get to Albuquerque, then I don't need to. Because I can go straight there. Because if no one else has gone there, there's no pattern to be detected. So he bought a ticket down to the office. I'd like a ticket to Albuquerque, please. So, oh, so all this stuff is for you. Feynman's like, Yes, that's right, because, of course, they'd been shipping boxes and boxes of stuff down to Albuquerque every day, and just assuming that no one at the train station was going to notice that all these packages were going to Albuquerque. But now it was fine, because now they knew what the packages were for. Professor Feynman was moving down there. So think about your, your biases is, the, is the, um, the point of that story. So what is programming the Feynman way? Well, there's a couple of ways we can answer this. We could use people as human transistors and build some pipelines. Now, that's kind of fun to do in the bar after a tech conference, but, or game at an extremely geeky party. But let's try something a bit less obvious. Let's try thinking about what themes are present in Feynman's work and life which are relevant to us as developers. So what kind of things are there? First and most important, explicit assumptions and approximations. How much data? How many concurrent users? What are our actual non-functional requirements for the damn thing? Yeah. One of the themes in his life was that, that Feynman was always explicit about the assumptions and the approximations of models. You know, for, for people that believe in, in, you know, in, in you know, science as this collection of absolute truth, it doesn't really work like that. 
It's a bunch of models. All models have assumptions. All models have non-functional requirements and, 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 and implicit things which you need to tease out from them. Um, one of the negative tendencies amongst developers is that if you see a model or um, uh, a system description which has explicit assumptions in it, people try to pick holes in it. They try to focus on the assumptions and figure out ways why the assumptions don't hold. And that's actually a very negative thing to do because a model which has assumptions and approximations which, which it tells you about up front, you, 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 know, you know where the limitations are. A model which doesn't attempt to do that has unknown pitfalls, which you, which you can only discover by blundering into them. So in fact, you know, that, te that temptation to, to, to pick at the assumptions is one which, which really should be resisted. And for, for, for programmers, then I think the, probably the, the equivalent statement is requirements gathering. You must always do proper requirements gathering. And then you document them. You work with other people that are interested in the system. You discuss with your peers. Now, I, I think we've heard the expression quite a few times, typing is not the bottleneck. Discussion and thinking about the, 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 the early stages of the system, you know, talking about it and getting more than one pair of eyes on it is always important. Um, I'm a big believer in documenting things as pro proper project artifacts. This doesn't need to be you know, a 500 page word doc document, you know, a wiki that you actually keep up to date because that's the great thing about wikis is they can be updated at any time and so rarely are. Um, but document things. People always forget this one. Revisit. Sanity check your assumptions. Once in a while, just take a simple case, work through it, make sure that what you're actually writing actually fits the assumptions and, and approximations you've made. Also bear in mind that this is a, a, a situation which changes over time. You need to revisit your assumptions. You need to check that things which were true six months ago are still true. For those of you that are building startup businesses which are going to scale, hopefully, you know, your, your volume assumptions may not make sense. Your patterns of distribution and, and where your users are coming from in the world may change radically in six months. You need to keep on top of that. And you need to know your data well enough to, to spot when that's starting to happen. Check your working. So this quote here, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, is, comes from the 1974 commencement address. And it's really talking about um, cognitive bias in a slightly different way. We all have things which drive our thinking. Um, and it's very easy for us to miss that those things are having an impact on how we think about our work. Um, my favorite example of this is actually performance tuning. So hands up if you ever have to do any performance testing. Okay. Hands up if you think you've got a good grasp of what you're doing when you do it. Okay, one person, it's yours. Um, okay, so so the, the the thing about this is that this is one area where the statistics and the mathematics of, of the uh, of measurement are actually really really important. Um, if you really really care about um, doing performance analysis properly, there's a paper called Statistically Rigorous Performance uh, Evaluation. Uh, it comes from like 2004, 2005, but it's still brilliant. It lays out all the stats that you need to actually, to actually get it done properly. Um, who writes micro benchmarks? Okay. Where do you work? Oh, okay. Yeah, you're, you're allowed to write micro benchmarks. Um, in general, the, 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 whenever people ask me about how to write a good micro benchmark, the answer is don't. Micro benchmarks are incredibly difficult to get right, and they're a great place to get bashed over the head with your cognitive biases. Um, I have quite a few interesting micro-benchmark stories to, again, to be told in the pub. Um, one of the biggest things which is important to do, if for any reason you are writing performance analysis or, or God forbid, micro-benchmarks, provide enough information that your peers can actually replicate this stuff. Um, I, I tend not to believe a single re a report of a micro-benchmark if the person hasn't provided me with a way to replicate it. Um, you, you, need to, you need to do that because if, if you start just reusing other people's conclusions blindly, you, you find yourself in a very bad place very, very quickly. Okay, so check, how, check your working. Okay, has anybody seen these diagrams before? No? Okay, cool. Right, so here we have some data. And we connect the dots and we have come up with a theory that the shape of the data is like this. Well, it's not the only way that, that that could be. There could be a bunch of other shapes for the data. So you can think of these guys as essentially conflicting theories, different possible explanations for the data. 
Okay, so what do we do? Well, if we're scientists, we get more data. And what this does is it rules out a bunch of models because there's no way that that shape can describe this data. Okay, cool. Okay, we've still got a couple of theories here. Um, and Feynman would have said about this step that it doesn't matter how smart the person who made the theory is, how beautiful it is, what his name was, what his academic record is. If it disagrees with the experiment, if it disagrees with the shape of the data, it's wrong. Sim simple statement. So with these two left, we can start to look at our assumptions. This one's got a lot of assumptions. This one has fewer. Therefore, we conclude that this one is more likely to be true. Now, so there we start modeling the, the shape of the data like this. Now, that's great, but is it the truth? Well, probably not, but it's as close as we can get given the available information. Um, so that concept of empiricism, of using real data and to fitting as closely as you can to the model while being aware and conscious of your limitations is uh, a recurring theme. By the way, I, c I could not for the life of me find a, a source for, th for these images on, on the internet. Um, so if anyone does have one and a decent attribution, then, then please let me know. Okay, so we have empiricism to add to our, our toolkit now. But what else did, did Feynman do that was, that was interesting and different? Use a basic toolkit. If you read his, his work, you will see again and again that he constantly learns and relearns and reapplies the basics. So we should do that with computer science. We should be using our, our basic tools on, on, on every day. Data structures, big O theory, type theory, understanding virtual machines, understanding Unix properly. Hands up if you run Windows in production. Right. Hands up if you think you're, you're, you've got a brilliant understanding of Unix. Okay, why is that? Because one of the things that we know is that the operating system characteristics and performance is in incredibly important. But there's also another astounding fact here, which, which again drives this, this, this uh, understanding Unix properly. Unix has survived for 40 years. Just think about that for a second. We work in the industry which has undergone the most radical change and you know, has had a transformative effect on society. And yet there is a design, and if you read Dennis Ritchie's 1973 paper, you will see that the design of Unix has not altered all that much. The Unix which, which Ritchie describes in 73 is utterly recognizable in 2013. So how can those two things be true unless there is something about the design of Unix which is utterly classic and you know, incredibly important? So therefore, if we're going to dive deeply and we're going to be deploying our production applications on top of this framework, we should understand it properly. The other interesting thing about that 73 paper is that it's very short. It's six pages long. It's not, you know, a 500-page Windows API tome. It's six pages, and it tells you, you know, not, not everything, obviously, because, of course, things have changed, but it tells you a great deal about, about the nature of the, the, the design of Unix. Um, well, that's an interesting point. So, so the question was, what about the QWERTY keyboard? We keep using that, isn't, isn't that the, the point? Well, and studies have been done. So the studies have been done about um, the, the QWERTY keyboard. And by the way, hands up, do you use Dvorak, anybody? No? Okay. So, so in, enough studies have now been done with Dvorak to show that there's no, it's, it, it provides no benefit over QWERTY. So, so it could be made that that's a satisfaction argument. But on the other hand, we have produced keyboards which, which, which are provably better than QWERTY. They just don't catch on. So, so that's probably more about network effect than anything else. Um, the barrier to entry to actually getting a, a, a different keyboard layout is so high, whereas the operating system market, we've had numerous entrants. So interesting point, though. OK, so we've got our basic toolkit. Whenever possible, understanding hardware. Hardware is starting to get more and more important again. We had a whole raft of time where we didn't really have to care about it, but those days are over. In our careers, we're going to have to start thinking more and more about, about hardware. Wherever possible, reduce the problem. You know, use approximations and, in particular, graphical techniques. 
which brings us very neatly onto quantum electrodynamics. So quantum electrodynamics is the unification of quantum mechanics and special relativity. Um, that's special relativity, not general. General relativity is really hard to unite with quantum mechanics. And this basically provides a thing called the, the, the standard model of particle physics. Um, this is the foundation stone. This is where it all starts from. Um, and this remained the most accurate physical theory ever devised for 30 years. Does anybody know how far it is from London to Los Angeles? I mean, two specific places. I mean, you know, um, the, the gates at, uh, at Universal Pictures, you know, to, to Nelson's Column. So a, a, a precise distance between London and Los Angeles. Anybody know what, how far it is? Yes, right across the circumference. No, but both, both things are stationary. I mean, the two points, you know, the gates of Universal Studios and, the, and Nelson's Column are both pretty stationary objects. Yes. Okay. Does anyone know how accurately that distance could be known using our measurement techniques? What do we think? 10 meters? Anyone want any advance on 10 meters? Five? Okay, so a few meters. Uh, if we had quantum electrodynamics to measure the distance between London and Los Angeles, we could measure it to within one thousandth of the thickness of a single human hair. That's how accurate it is. Um, and it, it wasn't, you know, it took 30 years to find anything else that we could be that, that precise and, and confirm measurements of. So, basically all modern physics pretty much relies on Feynman diagrams, and that's because they're an extremely powerful technique. They're computational and they're iterative. Every one of these diagrams represents a term in an equation. And the more complex the diagram is, the less it matters which is exactly what you need to, to describe a theory in terms of perturbations. You, you describe a basic set of interactions and then things which are more complicated and which matter less. So what this does is it decomposes the problem into tractable pieces and there are precise and very simple rules for computing any given diagram. So let's take a look at that. So here's your basic diagram. It's got two places where three particles come together. So that's second order. And these guys have got four. So these are, you know, not contributing very much, but probably still measurably. This one is, is your dominant term. So diagrams are great because you can automatically start to visualize these things, you know, in terms of paths of particles and possible ways that things are, are happening even when you can't see them. And I like diagrams. And it, I sometimes think of Feynman diagrams as being like the sequence diagrams of particle physics. I mean, everyone knows that, you know, there's UML and it's mostly not very helpful except for sequence diagrams be that you know, very simple interactions or actually precise things um, like the HTTPS handshake, which is this diagram here. Yeah? And not just those, state diagrams. Here you go, here's a thread state running diagram. Cool. So we need to simplify. Graphical techniques are great. We also need simplification techniques. Um, and one of the, the, the strongest, and this was a real surprise to me, is the single responsibility principle and the naming which goes with it. With single responsibility principle, the name should always encode the thing that it is responsible for. Um, complexity has huge hidden costs. You cannot write a class which is, which is more performant than one which isn't there. That sounds really stupid, but it's true. If you don't need to write code, don't write it. It is possible to write, by the way, um, a, a class which is as performant as one which isn't there, but that's only because the JIT compiler optimizes it away. So there's something else about naming which is kind of really interesting. Um, who has kids? A few people. Okay. So have you ever noticed that they kind of sometimes will ask the same question again and again? And there are, there are people who have this, this, this view of the world that if you keep asking the same question, eventually you get to the truth. You just keep asking the same question, slowly, bit by bit, all of the surface excuses and everything else which is above the real reason gets chipped away. Underneath is the, is the truth, is the real reason. If you do this with naming, it turns out that the amount of technical debt that you, do, you get goes incredibly sharply down. If you just focus on the naming and focus on making sure that the thing actually encodes what it's supposed to, it forces you to think about the problem uh, again and again, and eventually you end up with a system which is, uh, 
which is severely lacking in technical debt. And this is a good thing, because technical debt accumulates far faster and in a far more non-linear fashion than I'd realized. And it was about here where I'd started to notice and started to pick apart some of Martin's techniques to see what was really driving this, this performance improvement. And it turns out to be to do with technical debt. So what do you do with technical debt? Well, this is an agile principle, which I wholeheartedly believe in. If it hurts, you do it more often. Integration's a pain. Well, envelop, invent distributed version control and integrate constantly, because if it, if it hurts, do it more often. Because what underlies the essence of if it hurts, do it more often, is that there are certain things which have non-linear combination rules. And integration is one of those, testing is one of those, and technical debt is very definitely one of those. So if it hurts, do it more often, what it means is find the things which, which have non-linear contribution patterns and do those more often so that there's never enough of it to become a serious problem. Okay. So, quick aside, Moore's Law. As we can see, we've got this nice logarithmic scale up here. So between 1990 and 2005, the number of transistors on a chip went from a million to 100 million. Um, and that's amazing. You, know, you never see these long-term trends and to see something in, in, in something like computing, it's just, it's just crazy. I, 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 I still can't believe this. I, I still get, you know, a sense of disbelief every time I look at this graph. But it, what, it is what has been driving our industry for the last 50 years. And to return to the disease we were talking about, the disease of wanting to play with computers, this is what has been feeding that addiction. The availability of cheap computing power and to do two orders of magnitude in 15 years, we didn't spend that on functionality. Instead, we spent it on uh, additional craft and additional crap in our software. Um, I want to thank Martin Thompson for, for giving me this quote. Um, complexity has enormously large hidden costs and that, that means that we, we need to think very carefully before, before adding uh, additional stuff into a design. Um, this free lunch is running out. We know that it's running out, but I don't think that the, the, the consequences of what that's going to mean for software design and for projects have really started to be appreciated yet. Okay, so we need to be aware of new developments. If Moore's Law is running out, we need to start thinking about um, concurrency again uh, and hardware and all those kind of things. New technologies are, are really going to help, but please evaluate things on their merits. Don't use other people's conclusions. Don't just let, let, let what Hacker News says rule you know, the, your project development. Um, has anyone read this blog post, Why Developers Keep Making Bad Technology Choices? Okay, if you haven't read that, take a picture of this slide, Google that and read it, because it will talk about some of the forces which drive technology choices made by developers. Um, these are forces like boredom, um, upgrading your CV, um, peer pressure, and it's, it's a great example of how um, things which have nothing to do with technology and nothing to do with, uh, and everything to do with human nature, end up driving a lot of the technology decisions which get made. Hands up if you've ever shoehorned a technology into a project because you wanted to have it on your CV. <laughs> okay. Same thing, right? Uh, yeah, or, or, or wanted to play with it. Okay, so, so a few people, and I suspect a few more that are just too ashamed to put their hands up. <laughs> um, but using other people's conclusions is cargo cult science. Um, there are not all that many applications which, for example, need the ultra-high performance that, that some technologies claim to be able to provide. Um, but yet performance has been sold as something which everybody needs. And in truth, only a minority of applications really, really need the extremes of performance that are provided. Make your decisions em empirical. If you have a toolkit, a, a, a basic um, computer science skills, if you have an empirical approach, you, know, you can produce empirical decisions from that, or at least something which, um, which at least can guide the thinking better. Newer is not necessarily better. You know, there, there are plenty of, um, of NoSQL vendors who will tell you that there's something wrong with relational databases simply because they were invented in the 1970s. The wheel was invented quite a long time ago. Um, it's not necessarily bad because it's old. 
So be aware of new developments. Think critically about them. Share what you know. This is really important. You, know, you, you, know, you should always know where to get more information from, especially other people. And don't be afraid of not knowing something. There are two excellent kinds of knowledge. You can know about a subject um, that you, you, you already have facts and, uh, and a synthesis of, or you can know where to find more information about it. And for those of you who, uh, who like people and like talking to people, other people are usually the best source of information. Knowing who in your network you can go to talk to about a subject is, um, is one of the most valuable things you can have. Teach what you know to other people. One of the best ways of actually enhancing your own understanding of something is to teach it to somebody else. And it's this, one of the other cognitive biases that developers have is that you need to be a, an expert about something before you can teach it. Um, when I first learned to program Java, I was, I was doing my PhD. Um, and I was you know, a starving student, so I made some extra money by teaching um, Java, a language which I didn't know, to, to an undergraduate who uh, had some, you know, was physically disabled and couldn't, phys couldn't actually get to the lectures. So I had to stay ahead of the class, but that's all I had to do. And in some ways, that was actually the best way of teaching myself, because I, I had to go and forge the path, and then I'd work with him. And, and, and so we were only, I was only ever a, a week or two ahead of him in the material. Um, so yeah, but, but teaching what you know to others is a, is a, is a great thing. Um, and don't think that it always has to be the latest and greatest or the most intellectually demanding material that you know. Constantly reteaching the basics sharpens your mind and sharpens your basic toolkit in ways which are kind of hard to explain. Um, Re-examining the basics and relearning them as you teach them to somebody else you know, forces you to think about your own biases in the way that you think about the material. And when you can think about the basics from five or six different angles at once, you really know it. And there's a story about Richard Feynman from towards the end of his life here. And they were, they were walking in a forest, and Feynman had cancer, and he knew he was going to die. And th th they'd been walking in silence for a while, and his, his friend finally spoke up and said, Richard, I'm sad. I'm sad because you're going to die soon. Yeah, said Feynman. I, that kind of bugs me too. But not so much as you think. Because when you get to being as old as I am, and you start to realize that you've already told most of the good stuff to, uh, to other people anyway. They took another couple of steps, and Feynman says, Hey, I bet I can show you a new way home. So show what you know. Try out lots of ideas. Try out lots of subject areas. Feynman always reveled in trying out subject areas he was not an expert in. And don't be afraid to be wrong, or to, show, or to be shown a different point of view. You know, you, when, you, when you enter a new subject area for the first time, you, you, you build an understanding, you build a synthesis of knowledge in the best way you can, and then you try to compare it against experiment, and you may be shown that you're wrong, and that's fine. It's always okay to expect people who are subject matter experts, whatever the hell that means, and people that know more than you about the subject, to, to show you that you're wrong but you must also expect them to prove their assertions. Be careful about these things called rhetorical fallacies. Um, there's a website called Information is Beautiful. Has anybody seen this? Two people. Okay. Information is Beautiful. Go and check it out. It's brilliant. And they're, they're, they've got the great chart of these fallacies, which are errors in thinking. And the one that, that I, I always try to be most careful of is appeal to authority. Someone is not right just because they are, you know, they, they, they've, they've done it X or Y or Z. If, if their position is logical, they should be expected to be able to prove it. Um, seek out colleagues and people you like working with. Um, this, I, I really felt silly when I was writing this bullet point, bullet point because I thought, you know, surely there are people out there, you know, everyone knows that you actually should find a good environment to work in where you're actually challenged and you actually like being there. But again and again at events, I meet developers who are like, I hate what I'm doing, I hate the people I'm working with, and I can't get out. Well, even though you know, the economy might not be brilliant at the moment, there are always jobs out there, and this is pretty much one of the most important points in my whole talk. You've got to enjoy what you do. So, be inquisitive and be yourself. Travel, learn to speak new languages, whether they're you know, uh, foreign languages. Um, Feynman went to Brazil for a year, learned to speak Portuguese. He actually turned up in, 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 uh, in, in Brazil having learnt Spanish by mistake, so he then had to teach himself Portuguese as well. Um, diverse problems feed the mind and it's more fun. And I love this quote, I have no responsibility to be, to be like they expect me to be. Uh, it's their mistake and not my failing. Um, and this thing, what, 
people might be asking, why, why is there a van up here? So if I owned a van, which you can just about see on the slide, it's actually got Feynman diagrams painted on it. And uh, most people, of course, would just see a van with a bunch of squiggly lines on it. But um, every once in a while, someone would, uh, would, would stop, you know, would, would see the van and would pull up beside, and it was usually his wife who was driving, and would say, well, why does your van have, uh, have Feynman diagrams on it? And she'd say, because I'm Richard Feynman's wife. Okay, so in summary, build a simple mental toolkit. Focus on your fundamentals, focus on the computer science basics. They will repay you. Um, don't worry if you, if you feel that that was a long time ago and you've forgotten it. You know, there are some great books out there. Um, one book which I, I, um, I, I bought fairly early in my career was, is a book called Introduction to Algorithms. And despite the title, it is not an introductory text. It contains a great deal of advanced material in it. And so I always had that sat on my desk. And then one day, a, a junior developer that was working for me came and said, well, why do you have that book on your desk? Like, yeah, surely, don't you feel embarrassed? I'm like, no, because a focus on the fundamentals is, is, is where you know, a developer can most improve themselves and can add value which other people don't have. Um, visualizations and graphical techniques. This is an interesting one. Not everybody thinks graphically. Um, hands up if you think you think graphically. Okay, hands up if you think you don't. Yeah, and that's, that split's quite common. I actually would have probably expected a few more people to say they don't think graphically. Um, look, it, it, whichever side of the divide you're on, learn to understand the other point of view, because sooner or later you're going to have to work closely with someone who comes from the other school. Um, and it's, it, just, it just does seem to be a natural split. Um, Use empirical data. Use it extensively. Look for ways that you can actually use it. If you work in a business which generates a lot of data, spend some time thinking about what data is important and what's not. Um, with the rise of you know, big data, which is a horrible expression, I hate it, um, not all of it is going to be important and useful. So the, the sort of corollary to using empirical data is and know what of it is important. Always state your assumptions and approximations so they're out in the open. You can debate them. You can play with them, you can alter them, but you need to know what they are first. Share what you know. You teach your mentors and mentor your peers, younger developers, and focus on the basics. And there are puzzles and interesting things everywhere. Okay. Oh, and be yourself. So, after all this, this collection of ideas about Feynman, this Feynman method, is it different to Agile? Or is it just a particular approach to it? Well, let's have a look. So in what ways is it like Agile? Well, there's an emphasis on reducing the problem. There's an emphasis on breaking things down, and turning things into manageable chunks. Um, there's an emphasis on using simple tools, which you can think of kind of keeping overall control of your telemetry, not overcomplicating or over planning. You know, use of visualization techniques, for visualizing, you know, like, like Feynman diagrams, for visualizing your backlog, understanding where you are. Um, so all of those things are, are kind of similar. But what's different? Well, there's this explicit emphasis on empirical data. Lots and lots of agile approaches don't really call out the empirical aspect um, enough, in my opinion. Um, the use of graphical techniques is not mandated. Lots of places do it well. But it, it's, it's always been an implicit part of Agile rather than explicit, which is why it appears on this slide as well. Over and over again, I've seen failures to size the problem. People haven't thought about how much data they've got or what the problem space really looks like. Um, so this is really is more about doing decent domain-driven design. Um, very often, the stating and the documenting of assumptions doesn't happen properly. Um, that, I think, is, a, is, a, is an artifact of splitting the planning up. By only, by only planning for what you need to immediately build, it's possible that larger scale concerns, particularly non-functional requirements, performance, anything like that, just falls through the cracks. Without some kind of initial sketching and overarching view of the, 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 the project, it's easy for assumptions to get lost. And lots of people are always afraid to approximate. So is it the same? Is it different? Well, it's kind of 50-50. Um, it's either something new, or it's something which, which needs to be added on top of Agile in order to make it work properly. But always remember the cargo cult. The, 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 it wasn't until you actually see a really successful project in action that you can start to pick it apart 
that you can really see where the practices which actually contributing come from. So, some final thoughts. So, here I am, standing by a sign. Which I've named after Feynman. Does anybody know where, where this sign is? Yeah? Well, it's kind of next door to this thing. Um, and this is the Alice experiment at the Large Hadron Collider, uh, which was the, the sort of the most notable legacy of Feynman's work. I mean, this thing is huge. Um, but there's, a couple, there's one other point I'd like to make about it, which is... This isn't the set of Moonraker, by the way, in case you were wondering, or another James Bond film. This, this is actually the beam tunnel at the LHC, and I was actually fortunate enough to be one of the last people to go down and see it before it was sealed. Um, this experiment is very interesting because it is, um, the beam tunnel is actually reused from an earlier accelerator. So the, 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 they didn't dig a whole new tunnel for this thing. They, used, they reused an existing one. But the, 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 the accelerator that was down there before used electrons. Now, electrons are tiny. And in the Large Hadron Collider, they're putting in either protons, which are 2,000 times heavier, or the nuclei of lead atoms, which are hundreds of thousands of times heavier. But they've put it into the same tunnel. Now, who's driven a car on a, on a, on a closed track or just around a tight corner? Yeah. So when something's heavier, how do you keep it on the same curve? Well, you have to go faster. And if you work out how much faster you have to go, because the, the beam tunnel's in a circle, to keep these he much heavier particles on the same track without flying out, you actually get quite an interesting stat, which is that the technology for accelerators has had to, ex has had to advance at the same rate as Moore's law. And in the technology field, it is the only other example I know of, apart from chips, which have, have had the same sort of increase over the same sort of time. So it, just a weird coincidence, I'm sure. Um, but it was kind of interesting to find that and to find this, this sort of echo of Moore's law down there in the tunnel. And one very, very final thought. You know what this is? Well, this sticker, which you can't read, says in capital letters, this machine is a server. Do not power down. Okay. Can you see what kind of machine it is? There's, you can just make, that, make the logo out. It's an Xbox. This is the first web server that ever existed at CERN. This is Tim Berners-Lee's machine. And it just goes to show that no matter what you do, there can be consequences. Because, of course, CERN wouldn't exist without Richard Feynman. And without CERN, there would be no web. Thank you. Um, I'm going to leave this slide up in case people want to grab the, the biography. Um, two minutes for questions. That's not the problem. The problem is, is that silicon wafers are constrained in size. Um, and there, I mean, while at some point you will run into effects where, where the, um, the, the, the waves which hold a particular state for a bit start becoming sufficiently small that they, they become indeterminate and they start overlapping. So essentially quantum effects start becoming more of a problem. We're not that far off that now, but, and it's been a long time since I did any semiconductor physics. Um, the, other, the other problem is that before you hit that limit, there are some odd properties that sort of the, the sort of next scale up, which mean that you, you can't get down as, uh, to as close to single atoms as you want to. Any other questions? Yes? Ah, so, so the question was, how, how, in how much contradiction is Agile to some of the principles that I talked about? I don't think it's necessarily in contradiction. So the, 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 the point really is that in, in too many cases, Agile is a cargo cult. You, you're performing these, the, these practices, hoping to get this, this benefit of this order of magnitude gain in productivity, um, but you don't really know what it is that's causing that. And so, so 
which you know you haven't really sort of delved deep enough into the problem to see which practices um, are, are going to give you that up, that uplift. Um, one other point is that there are circumstances under which the same practices don't work for two different teams. Some some teams will will, will need a slightly different mix. There are some practices I think which are um, common and which are probably essential, um, but. In terms of you know, the, the whole set of practices you need, I think it's probably a slightly different set for, for, for different teams. Um, reduction of technical debt um, and particularly adherence to, to, to strict code review are two of the things which I think probably are essential. Okay, thank you.